motors leads into VFDs really well. Those are kind of the things I see out when I go out to things in the field to say, okay, people that I think should have known better in commercial and industrial plants have messed up. Okay, didn't pay attention to. Okay, so VFDs, we see them everywhere now. Commercial, industrial, even residential. Where do we see residential VFDs? At the house. Air conditioning. Variable speed compressors. Energy efficient washing machines. Some of the new Sears and other super duper energy efficient washing machines have a VFD in them to save energy in the certain cycles they're doing. I've relayed this story in past classes. I had to go to Rockford, Illinois, west of Chicago. 4,000 to 6,000 square foot homes on a couple of acres being developed. And the utility wants somebody to come in and look at a system where every time when the washing machine goes in the spin cycle at the house, the garage doors go up. <laughs> and those VFDs and the, the VFD and the washing machines kicking off a bunch of harmonic noise that happen to ride on that same frequency as the garage door opener. And, you know, no big deal when all four of your garage doors go up at the same time you know, when you're not home. Because you walked out after you put the, the wash started the, the button, right? So, you know, that was one of those is just like, what? I can't even believe you're telling me this. I get the crazy ones sometimes, you know? And, and uh, I, you know, you know I, I've always often wondered if I should be charging more when the other end of the phone says, we've tried all kinds of people and they said to call you. <laughs> <laughs> Or if I'm just the one that gets all of everybody's, you know, stuff they don't want to deal with pushed off onto me. So that becomes important. Why are we using, we're varying the speed or flow of the operation and the application in the equipment we're running. Now, one of the things that I found out, I get a lot of questions on when I go into plants today and talk to technical people is, well, tell me, update me about the market for drives and all these terms they're trying to sell me with flux vector and closed loop and open loop and sensorless, what does all that stuff mean to me and the plant? Why do I care? And so if I look at the drive market today, VFDs, almost all the VFDs you're going to buy today are pulse width modulated, acronym PWM. Go, go back 20 years, there were variable voltage and variable current source drives and PWMs. PWMs are the newest all-electronic drives. Came out about 20 years ago and have essentially pushed the others, older technologies, out of the market for new drives. <coughs> Within the PWM category, pulse width modulated, the basic drive is called a variable voltage variable frequency drive or VVVF. So this is the standard drive most companies will give you unless you specify a higher response or faster response drive. This drive essentially reduces the frequency and the voltage at the same ratio as it adjusts the speed of the motor. That's how it works. Now today, manufacturers of drives have a newer technology within the PWM category called flux vector drives. Flux vector drives vary the volts and the hertz separately. And by doing that, I get faster response and more precise speed control of the motor the drive is controlling. So when you want faster response and more precise speed control, the flux vector drives give you an option there to go to. What do you suppose the price of those is? Significantly higher. Because they do way more great things. Okay. So if I need that fast response and precision, there's a box that can do that. I have to pay more money for it. Now, within the flux vector category, there are closed loop and open loop flux vector drives. Sometimes these are called sensor drives and sensorless drives. So to get that faster response, the flux vector drive uses 
sensors on the motor shaft and on the equipment. How do I know if I want to control a motor to speed it up and slow it down within one revolution? So I want it to run from top dead center to 13 degrees at a certain speed. From 13 degrees to 97 degrees, I want to speed it up. From 97 around here to 320, I want to slow it down. So I want to change speed that precisely within a revolution of the motor. These drives can do that. Now how do I know where the shaft of the motor is to know when to change the speed. I need a shaft encoder. So now I have a position sensor that feeds information back to the drive that tells me where that shaft is. Can you imagine when I put a bunch of these sensors on this drive, it raises the price to do that. But it gives me very precise, fast speed response. Then, the manufacturer got tired of people saying they're too darn expensive. I'm not going to buy one of those. I'll stick with my DC drives. Because DC drives were typically that domain of fast and precise. So then the manufacturers came out with the open loop or sensorless flux vector drives. Where now, instead of putting all the sensors on there, they're using a mathematical equation or algorithm for position. So now, not as expensive, can that algorithm or that equation we program into it be as precise as a real sensor? Probably not. What happens if you change the conditions? If you've got a sensor on there, you just reprogram a few things. Now, if I change the conditions with a sensorless open loop drive, I have to essentially change my whole algorithm to meet the new conditions. Okay? So that's what we're talking about. So the VVVF is the standard. Essentially, that's what you tend to get. It works really well where the change in speed doesn't have to be instantaneous, like within a hundredth of a second. We don't need to control it as precisely. Much lower cost, as I said. The flux vector, closed loop, more sophisticated, can be important for sensitive types of applications, certain types of constant torque loads that were traditionally done with DC drives and specialty motors. Why would we want to go away from a DC drive and a DC motor to an AC drive and an AC motor? Cost? cost. Which costs? DCs. Okay, let's go fixed and variable. How about the difference in fixed and variable? Okay, let's say maintenance. Which one of those, AC or DC, has a whole bunch more maintenance requirement? DC. The DC. The drive and the motor. So one of the temptations and one of the reasons the manufacturers have gone this route is to say, okay, you complain about the maintenance of DC drives and motors, we've come up with an AC drive and motor that will take less maintenance. Less maintenance requirements. Oh, but it costs a pretty good chunk. But it's less maintenance. There's your marketing spiel in terms of that. So lower cost than a DC drive, but higher cost than the standard VVVF drive because it requires the closed loop controls to monitor the driven load. So that sensorless attempts to give the performance of a closed loop without using as many sensors and feedback devices to keep the price down. Okay, so I use an algorithm programmed in the drive. I get most of the advantages of the closed loop without additional cost and complexity of the sensors. The accuracy of the algorithm for the motor voltage and frequency control compared to the needs of the system becomes the limiting factor. Can I do it with an algorithm or do I need to go all the way up to the closed loop drive? How do you handle variations that aren't in your model when they occur, your algorithm? I've got to go in and change it. So those are the types of drives that you can select from the market today in terms of we have a drive on a piece of equipment that's not fast enough or precise enough. There's options out there today, but they're pretty pricey. 
that may not be the DC drive. Or if you have DC drives and you're really wanting to get rid of the DC drives and DC motors, now there's an option on the AC side, less maintenance, less things to go wrong. That's where those things fit into the market. What about DC drives? Those are still have their place in the industry, but the AC drives, the flex vector, have made some inroads there. They tend to be expensive, sophisticated drives, more complex DC motor, requiring lots of maintenance. And finally, ECM motors. What's an ECM motor? Electrically commutated. This is the motor manufacturer's attempt at a more efficient single phase size motor. So below 10 horsepower. So an electrically commutated motor is a DC motor, a special DC motor with no brushes, with a DC drive built into the enclosure. So it's one package. It looks like a motor. The electronics in the drive are in the enclosure of the motor. And now these are lower cost than a single phase VFD, AC VFD, and AC motor. Lower maintenance cost than a traditional DC motor. Okay. I got in trouble for some motor people for saying that's kind of a motor you know, that was built to you know, advertise technology, that we've built a motor that maybe the market didn't find a need for. But I've since found when they looked, and I looked at the efficiencies of these, the efficiency of a five horsepower e ECM motor is much higher than the efficiency of a five horsepower single phase motor. So there's their marketing sales point. So if you have some single phase motors in that seven and a half, five, two and a half horsepower range, and you've never had a good alternative for high efficiency before, now there's something out there that can address the efficiency of those motors significantly better than what we used to have available. That's their place in the market. Target applications, higher efficiency than single phase, speed control. What happens if I put a VFD, an AC VFD, on a capacitor start compressor motor? What happens if I slow it down enough? My start windings kick in and burn out. Yeah, can't do that. So another application. So a lot of the HVAC folks are seriously looking at these types of motors from an efficiency and I get rid of starting winding problems now in motors. Okay? Lower maintenance cost integrates into existing and future DC systems. As we're seeing more DC systems in some plants, okay, I got a DC driving motor to integrate into that. So we'll see what happens with those. And so some of the application and purchase considerations out there. Some of the things to think about when consultants come in with energy efficiency measures and they say we're going to put some VFDs in here. You're buying some new equipment that comes with VFDs on it that never had VFDs before. The cost benefit ratio. That's historically we've used energy savings to justify the cost of a VFD. That is changing significantly. Today there are VFDs going in that's not so much about energy control costs, but improved process control. Can I use that VFD to control the process so I get more consistent and less off-spec product by doing a better job with speed control? People say, well, you know, give me an example. A tunnel oven, I'm baking bread. I put a loaf or a, a, a pan of dough on one end, the conveying belt moves it slowly through the oven, it comes out the other end as a cooked loaf of bread. What's my variable in terms of how dark that crust gets on that loaf of bread going through that tunnel oven? Heat and speed. And that heat could change throughout the day by the BTUs in the natural gas or propane I'm burning, couldn't it? And so if I have constant speed and my BTU content of my gas changes in the pipeline coming in, I could undercook or overcook. And so the idea is now I'm going to put sensors in that tunnel 
and I know about what that crust should look like a color at a certain point. If it's darker, I can speed it up. If it's not as dark, I can slow it down. So every loaf of bread coming out of the end of the tunnel has that nice, perfect color that I want. And I don't have people saying, well, don't buy their bread because some of them are really dark and burnt and some of them aren't baked enough. I'm never buying them again. Are there benefits to doing that? Sure, there are. Better consistency, less off-spec product in terms of that business case. Maintenance. <clears throat> Again, nobody that I'm aware of has ever put in a VFD solely on reduced maintenance cost, but that can be one of those additional things in addition to energy savings, <clears throat> improved co process control or both that we use to say, oh, and by the way, now we get a bunch of those valves out with that caustic material flowing through them, and now we control the flow of that caustic material with the speed of the pump, and we don't have to do so much valve maintenance anymore. And that's a good thing. Power quality. The biggest question I think people don't ask themselves there going forward is can I use existing motors and do I need filters? when I put in VFDs. Now those are the big things I see when I respond to then things out there. Now one of the things that again is important to understand, a VFD is a complex electronic control. And when I look in that VFD it's all electronics, power electronics and devices. So do I need to protect those circuit boards from various different disturbances, electrical disturbances that could come in on the line to that VFD? And the answer is, yeah, just like I would protect computers and other electronic controls in my facility if they're mission critical. And so what's the environment? Is it mission critical? Does a problem, what does a problem cost you in lost production, cleanup, or safety if we have an electrical power disturbance that burns out a board in the VFD or takes out some of the electronics like some of the IGBTs or things like that, what supply deviations do you presently have in your plant that you already know are there? Do you have some pretty healthy voltage transients or spikes? Do you have swells and over voltage or sags and under voltage? or potential single phasing, or already have some harmonic distortion in your electrical system. Those are all things that we're starting to think about before we put new electronics into a building without protecting them. So if I have some of these things, whether I put a new PLC or electronic control or a VFD in my plant, if I have specific ones here, I might want to start thinking about protecting that expensive drive from some of those things that happen in my plant. How do I protect the drive <clears throat> from whatever the line coming in can feed to it that might cause it a problem? So the drive line considerations, harmonic distortion, big one, neutral heating it can cause. These are things that that drive can cause upstream on the line, transformer heating. The harmonics from VFDs can cause neutrals to overheat or transformers to heat and have reduced life. In a three-phase power system, if I've balanced all three phase from a single phase standpoint, how much current should flow on the neutral? None. Certain harmonic frequencies, the odd multiples of three, 9, 15 odd numbers that 3 will go into perfectly, add on the neutral, the harmonics. So if I have devices producing the 9th harmonic, the 15th harmonic, the 21st harmonic, that current adds on the neutral in a three-phase system. And we're seeing lots of schools grade schools, middle schools, high schools that are burning up neutrals in their facility, new schools, six or eight months in and the neutral is fried or simply burned in two. 
What do we normally do to size a neutral historically? Drop it down what from the phase conductors? One size or two size. Depends on where you're standing in the country. So the code says you're allowed to reduce a neutral. The part that I always point out and makes people mad is <clears throat> the code says provided you did an engineering calculation to show it wouldn't be a problem. Anybody ever done that engineering calculation? I've seen a few people do that. Yeah. Okay. But historically we've just said okay History has told us we can drop it down at least one size, if not two, and be okay. Why would schools be a huge problem here, as I'm describing this concern on neutral heating or burning up the neutral? LED lights. LED lights producing harmonics. What else producing harmonics? In the name of energy efficiency, what did they put on all the ventilation blowers and the chiller? VFDs. And then what do you have on every desk in that school? Computers. So these are very harmonic distortion rich environments today. And that's where we're seeing a huge, huge issue in new schools. It's all the electronics that's everywhere in that building. And these certain harmonic frequencies adding on the neutral that's burning neutrals up. I now have seen five different schools, new schools, that have double sized neutrals from the phase conductors. And when he did the calculations, that's what the calculation said I needed to size the neutral. Okay. So that's just a really strange new thing to look at and say what in the world compared to the old reliable <coughs> ideas we had in our head. Okay, I've seen one that was sized to 150% of the phase conductors that essentially burned in two in four months. It wasn't big enough. Okay. So these are things that are happening in other facilities. Now I always tell co-ops and utilities that I do a class like this for in front of key accounts, it's probably not the group that comes to the class you really want to get to. It's those folks that already know everything and they don't need to come to any class to learn anything new. You just ask them. They know it all already. Folks like you, most of you that take time out of your schedule to come to sit and see if you can pick something up today, when I go to your facility I find they're pretty, pretty well in order, those types of things. But these are places that I see and I go all the time to respond to issues and make a very good living as you know <clears throat> a consultant doing that transformer heating what happens to the life of my transformer when I overheat it compared to its design level I shrink it those harmonics can do that as well faulty operations of other electronic loads if I put enough of a right frequency of a harmonic frequency on another electronic device, I can mess, up, mess it up and make it send faulty signals, if not lock up. Capacitor failure, we mentioned that before. Harmonics at the right frequency cause those capacitors to vibrate or resonate, and that can be problematic. In addition, those harmonics can travel through the co-op electrical distribution system from the customer creating them to your plant. And so I respond to a lot of those. Help, we have a problem with a customer who's complaining about harmonics, and we measure them, they're coming in through our meter, but we don't have any equipment making harmonics. Where is it coming from? Got to be coming from another customer down the road somewhere, using the co op distribution system to transfer now and cause problems somewhere else. Okay, so all of those are common VFD complaints that I respond to all over the country. Particularly, I make a lot of money responding to those things for water utilities. Why water utilities? <coughs> what have they put on every motor and pump that they have that they can? VFDs. VFDs. Yeah, that's the common denominator there. Now, so those are potential problems then <clears throat> that VFDs can, if you're not careful and do some legwork in advance to think about, cause. 
in facilities and commonly cause all over the country. Possible solutions. If my VFDs are going to produce harmonics, I put a filter, reactor, or choke of some type in front of that VFD to prevent those harmonics from going into the rest of my electrical system. So I trap those harmonics locally before they can get to another piece of equipment to do any of those different things. Okay, that's one strategy in terms of using filters, reactors, or chokes. Another, if I'm burning up neutrals, upsize the neutral. Get it big enough so it can handle the heat. K-factor transformer. A K-factor transformer is a transformer that's meant to be used where there's lots of harmonic distortion and extra heat, and that transformer will not have a reduced life. So these are transformers meant to be used in a harmonic rich environment like typically exist with lots of VFDs in a facility. I can check the resonant frequency of my cap banks. We talked about that earlier. Look at IEEE 519 guidelines to make sure I'm not producing too many harmonics. Transient voltage surge suppression for the oscillatory transients or a UPS or other ride-through device. Now on the other side, these are things that the VFD causes. These are things that the VFD can trip from and have nuisance tripping and shut our process off. Transients, interruptions, and harmonic distortion from elsewhere. So with VFDs, it's not quite as simple as many of the manufacturers and salespeople would say, just throw it in and see if it works. And the general approach is, when you ask them about these things, well, my competition, if you buy my competition's drive, yeah, you better plan on those problems. But we've had some issues in the past, but we redesigned our drives. And you probably won't have these problems. From a sales or marketing per person, what does probably mean? You probably won't. I'm not going to guarantee it. And then you will come back if they see that look of a little concern on your face and say, oh, well, we have the filters and chokes and other things we can put on if it's a problem. So now there's a problem. I get pulled into it. I come in. I essentially look everything over. Okay, you need to do this, that, and the other. And some vice president looks at me and says, well, why didn't anybody tell us about this stuff? My response is, well, I guess because your purchasing process is trial and error. Do vice presidents like being accused of having a process of trial and error? And you can see them kind of bristle up, defensive, and then they realize, I guess he's kind of right. We bought the stuff, threw it in, and then we asked the question, and the guy said it probably won't have that problem. And so now we're back to trial and error, throw it in, and if we have a problem, we come back and we do the things to put them on them. Okay? That's how we do drives today. The, the neutral heating, when you're referring to upsizing neutrals, are you referring from the switch gear to the transformer, or are you referring from that circuit to the main? Yeah both on branch circuits and feeders where those neutral current or those harmonic currents are flowing in the system. Okay, what happens when it once gets to the transformer that's on the utility side? What happens on the other side there? Yeah, same thing. It carries right on. Yeah, and so now in terms of the, okay, from my standpoint, once we've gone, the transformer will dampen on the phases, but there's no anything connection other than a solid connection on the neutral. So that's where these currents are flowing from one place to another is on that utility neutral, getting down the road and doing that. And Terry, go back to this, you know, animals and concern, dairy cows, anything. What happens when I increase current on the primary neutral? More chance of animals being shocked down the road from stray voltage or people in uh, marinas in water parks when that happens. And so that's the, okay, 
Why do utilities care about it moving from one to another? Well, maybe now you're the one being impacted by equipment that's not working, or you're being impacted by, because of higher neutral current than what people thought was out there in your water park, like we had a couple of folks yesterday in the class, now folks are being shocked while they're wet between the concrete and the metal that's bonded to the grounding system at the water park that they paid to get into. Okay. And they can't be convinced that that's part of the ride, the shocking, you know. <laughs> so a well-kept secret in VFD world is that NEMA, that National Electrical Manufacturers Association, has what they call an application guide for AC adjustable speed drive systems. This was a document developed by NEMA in 2001 to address what are the things that you and your pr facility might want to think about at least asking or taking into account when I put a VFD in. And so some of this stuff is a checklist. Okay, I thought about that, we looked at the numbers, check that off. Move on to the next thing. Some of it talks about, okay, if you have a condition, for example, where the drive and the motor are farther than 20 feet apart, what potential problems could that create? And it gives you some information to get from the drive and the size of the conductor and figure out if you're going to have a voltage overshoot problem at the motor terminals because of the distance between the drive. And it will then allow you to go through and put that information in and make a calculation that says this is definitely a potential problem or this is not a problem at all. I do that. I look, it's not a problem, check that mark, move on. That's why I like this document a lot. Because it really is a road map of what do I need to think about if I put a VFD in my facility. And my conditions are different than normal. Or different than my neighbor's conditions. Or another sister plant of mine in another state. That's the one I like. We have other plants in other states and they don't have a problem with this drive on this piece of equipment. Okay. What's not exactly the same between that plant and this plant on the piece of the equipment? Well, the utility. So it's got to be the utility power. You know? Oh, okay. Yeah, we can go there or we can start looking for other things. So it's about 100 pages. It was updated in 2007, 2015. If you want them to mail you the pretty copy with the slick cover and color, they're going to charge you 131. If you go to the NEMA website and search for that document, you can download a PDF for free. Now when my kids come to me and say, Dad, it's free, I know to ask, what's the monthly subscription fee after you get the free thing, you know? Or what other game packs do you need to really play it for real rather than just the original free thing? This is one of those things I can tell you exceeds the cost of free and doesn't have extra things attached to it. So you've heard about free and it's not so free. This exceeds the value you're giving for it. It's a really good document. So I encourage you, if that's something you have concerns about at your facility, get the free copy of that, download it, look through it to say, okay, what have we not been thinking about when we put a VFD in the plant that maybe in the future we just ought to go through so we can avoid some of those problems up there on the slide and avoid bringing somebody like me in as a consultant with their handout saying, I want money. Okay? You know what a consultant is, right? Consultant is somebody you bring into your facility and you ask them what time it is and they ask to borrow your watch to look at your watch to tell you what time it is and they tell you what time it is and then they slip their, your watch in their pocket and keep it. That's a consultant, right? Okay. So, another one of those things that utilities all over the country are emphasizing Really focus on this when you're talking to my customers, okay? It's really important that they think about this. Doesn't matter anywhere in the U.S., drives and utilities today. The pulse number rating of the drives that you're buying. The pulse drive number has a big impact on how many harmonics 
it produces out of that drive and what their frequencies are. So three-phase VFDs use multiples of six on their front end in their rectifier configuration. So I can buy a six pulse drive, that's the standard VFD, the low end cost one, 12 pulse, 1824, I've even seen 30 and 36 pulse drives. By going to a higher pulse number of drive, I reduce the harmonic frequencies coming out of that drive to impact the rest of my facility. Okay? So that's a number we can look at when we're thinking about the drive. So those problematic odd harmonic frequencies can be calculated based on the drive pulse number and compared to, for example, your resonant frequencies of your capacitor banks for power factor correction. The higher the pulse number, the lower the noise and harmonic distortion the drive produces, but the more complex and costly the drive. That's the plus and the minus side of it. So VFD harmonics. A VFD, based on its pulse number, produces a fingerprint if I look with an oscilloscope or frequency analyzer at the harmonic frequencies coming out of that drive going back upstream. And so this is an example of a six pulse drive. My first harmonic is my 60 cycle. The second harmonic, which you see is small, would be two times 60, 120 cycles per second. The third harmonic, relatively small, three times 60, 180 cycle per second. What do you notice the first two big harmonic frequencies out of a six pulse drive are? Fifth and the seventh. And then the ninth is small, but the eleventh and the thirteenth are big. It's typically probably 90% of the time when there's a problem with the VFD causing harmonic issues in your plant, the fifth or the seventh that's causing that problem. Because those are the biggest ones. And they're also fairly close to the fundamental, 60. So here's how this drive pulse number thing works. There's an equation the drive essentially complies with. The harmonic frequencies that are big that that drive is going to inject back upstream on the line side of the drive to the rest of your plant is n, an integer, times the pulse number of your drive plus or minus 1. So for a 6 pulse drive we start at 1 with the n up here. 1 times 6 plus or minus 1 gives us 5 and 7. There's my 5th and 7th. A 12, or the second one. Now for a 6 pulse drive, we uh, go up 1 for the integer. 2 times 6 plus or minus 1 says the next big set is the 11th and the 13th. There you go. If I went to 3 times 6 plus or minus 1, the next big set becomes the 17th and the 19th. So we know which harmonic frequencies that 6 pulse drive is going to be injecting back into our electrical power system in our facility. And if we know we have something like a capacitor bank that resonates at the 5th or the 7th or the 11th or the 13th, we have a potential problem. We have to address. Now when I go to a 12 pulse drive, notice 1 times 12 plus or minus 1 says the first problematic harmonics that are big I get out of a 12 pulse drive are the 11th and the 13th. What did I just eliminate by going to a 12 pulse drive? The 5th and the 7th. Which did I say were 90% of the problem most of the time? 5th and the 7th. So I automatically get rid of two of the biggest problematic frequencies that cause harmonic problems in a facility by going to a 12 pulse drive. The next set, 2 times 12 plus or minus 1 is the 23rd and 25th. I don't get the 17th and the 19th like I do with the 6 pulse drive. So I'm removing half the harmonics and taking the two biggest ones out by going to a 12. If I go to an 18 pulse, 1 times 18 plus or minus 1, I don't have 5th or 7th or 11th or 13th. My first set's the 17th and 19th. I now see utilities 
particularly on both coasts, that in some cases are saying, you may no longer use a six pulse drive in your facility. We will not provide you electric service unless you have 12 or higher pulse drives. And so all of a sudden now, that takes away a lower cost option from you, the facility, in doing that. I've seen other utilities, instead of specifying you have to have a 12 or 18 pulse drive, that have said you can use a six pulse drive, but it must have some type of filtering reactors or chokes on the line side of it. I had a co-op engineer in New Mexico. He was having a heck of a time with harmonics. He couldn't even read his remote meters on some of the long oil patch, where there's lots of oil pumping and processing lines out of a substation. Because the harmonic noise from the VFDs was overriding the signal from the automatic meter reading system. You know it's real progress when you upgrade your metering system as a co-op and then you have to call every customer on that line and say, we're going to have a planned outage from 10 till 10.15 this morning. So everybody on that substation is without a power for 15 minutes so we can read the meters to get rid of the harmonics. That's progress right there. That's technology, you know. So there's been some things like that where some of these utility engineers' knee-jerk reaction was to say, no more six pulse drives. And so I told my friend the engineer, I said, okay, your board of directors is going to get screamed at from the member oil companies. Who are your biggest key accounts? Your most important revenue customers. You are really tying their hands now in terms of economics of buying drives. Expect some pushback. And he called me later, he says, oh, we had the, the, the monthly board meeting yesterday and we haven't had attendance like that from our customers in a long time. I said, was this all about your policy? Oh, my policy does not exist anymore. <laughs> So that's what utilities are struggling with, okay? Try to convince you that 12 and 18 pulse drives are the preferred good thing and why, or try to be draconian and come out and say, here is our policy, our mandate. You shall not use six pulse drives, or you can use six pulse drives, but you have to put filters, chokes, or reactors on them. That's what they're struggling with because these harmonic problems have become such a big deal. When I got walked into a situation a number of years ago and I had diamond shamrock on one side of the road in a refinery who was causing harmonic problems with all their VFDs for a Koch Brothers facility on the other side of the road shutting it down, I thought, well, this is wonderful because each of those companies is big and they have lots of rocks with attorneys with rocks to throw across the road each other, blaming each other. And I was right, the billable hours, as those attorneys threw rocks at each other for two or three years, for me, just kept going up and up and up. And I said, we'll just put up a filter and block them from going across the road. Diamond Shamrock says, we're not paying for it. Koch Brothers says, we're not paying for it. Utility says, we're not paying for it. Koch Brothers says, Diamond Shamrock's making them, make them pay for it. Diamond Shamrock says, Koch Brothers got the problem with their crappy electronic equipment tripping off, they ought to pay for it. So that's the back and forth today with these harmonic things, that utilities are finding themselves in the middle of one customer and another customer throwing rocks at each other, blaming each other, one of them has a huge problem, the other one's creating it, and neither one wants to budge. So that's the issue. So incentives. Your electric co-op has incentives, at least right now, for VFDs to your plant systems. Hoosier and the electric co-ops have had programs where, if it qualifies, that new VFD can get a rebate check. 
The incentive amount for VFDs is $30 per horsepower controlled. The equipment must operate more than 3,000 hours per year. Okay, we had this discussion yesterday. How many hours in a year? That's not a number you keep on the front of your brain. If you do energy audit stuff, it just sticks after a while. 8,760. Now, why did I ask you that? I saw a proposal for some new energy efficient equipment from a consultant a while back, you know, us consultants, that had these refrigeration compressors operating 12,000 hours a year. <laughs> and the payback was really, really good. <laughs> Trouble is, if there's only 8,760 hours in a year, I don't know how you operate them 12,000 hours a year. Yeah. Garbage in, garbage out, right? In this case, it was garbage in, gospel out. And consultants said so. See, it's right there in the report. So again, you've got to wash its consultants with our numbers as well. Make sure they're real world to do that. <laughs> Redundant backup or replacement drives don't qualify. VFD speed must be automatically controlled by differential pressure or flow or temperature or some other variable signal. I can't just be manual control with the VFD to change speed. There's got to be a feedback system of something that does it automatically to get your money from Hoosier for the rebate program. Okay? Now, should I use a general purpose motor with a VFD. Can I put a VFD on an existing motor and not have problems? Maybe. So if I go back and look at the motor market, NEMA says that manufacturers in the US can build standard general purpose motors and what those mean. Standard NEMA ratings for general use, they're the least expensive and most available. They have medium ratings on about everything they were designed to do. There are applications where a standard or general purpose motor will not last in that environment or conditions. What's special about a food processing motor? Why is a food processing motor categorized as a definite purpose motor within the NEMA motor jargon? Wash down. Because I'm going to be washing that down probably with corrosive detergents and high pressure water what happens to a general purpose motor over time? Corrosion. Corrosion of the frame, things like that. Simply will not last because of the corrosion. So most food processing definite purpose motors come with stainless steel enclosures or a dipped encapsulated enclosure in plastic or epoxy to withstand the corrosion. A farm duty motor is a definite purpose motor. A farm duty motor will still cool itself and not overload due to heat with an inch of dirt and gunk on the enclosure. You know how farm motors end up, right? If you've done farm audits, you have to take the sleeve of your coveralls and knock the inch of dirt and debris off to find the nameplate. Does that insulate the heat? Keep it in there? Sure. Now, where I'm going with this? There are some relatively new categories that NEMA has within the definite purpose motor classification. Those are inverter fed and inverter duty motors. The inverter fed and inverter duty motors are definite purpose motors designed for use with the VFD, with the drive. There's a lot of applications you can put a drive on an existing standard general purpose and not have a problem. Some places it's not going to work. So, in my experience, if I'm going below 50% of the motor's rated speed, I'm starting to get worried about putting a VFD on a general purpose motor and that motor having heating issues. If that's a totally enclosed fan cooled motor, why am I concerned about that motor heating going below 50% rated speed. What happened to the speed of my fan? What happened to my airflow volume? Way down. So that's where we tend to see issues. If I'm going below 50% rated speed for very long, 
we start to get that motor failing prematurely because of heating issues, breaking down the insulation and the windings faster than it was designed for. That's a big issue. These motors are meant to take certain things a VFD can dish out and not reduce the life. So technically, these are motors designed to be used with the VFD specifically, as opposed to these that weren't really designed to be used with the VFD, but can still in some cases work. And that's an economic decision now going forward when you put a VFD into a plant. Do I need to have one of these extra heavy duty beefed up motors for a VFD? Or can I get by with the standard general purpose that cost a lot less? So, inverter ready duty motors. The inverter ready motor is a general purpose motor built with anticipation a drive might be added in the future with class H insulation. So we're going to take a general purpose motor with B Instead of winding it with B, we're going to put H insulation into it to withstand the heat when that motor slowed down and we lose some of that cooling air from the fan. That's what you're buying. Better insulation. I have, in the oil patch where I work a lot, the oil companies have drives on everything. The motor rewind shops in those areas only use N insulation to rewind. Because they know that motor's going back out there on a VFD. And if I look and I say, okay, what's the worst thing that could happen to this motor outside on a 114 degree day in West Texas with the fan and the RPM of the motor run way down to a low pumping level? And insulation gets us where we want to be to say, I'm not going to reduce the life significantly from that drive. Okay? And if I only have in insulation in my warehouse to rewind motors with, that at least takes away some of the cost and confusion of having all kinds of different insulation classes. Because I know 97% of the motors I'm rewinding are going back out on a VFD. That philosophy. Okay? So, it will still have a distance limit the motor can be placed from the drive. That distance limit will be 35 feet. If I go above 35 feet between the motor and the drive on a submersible pump, I still could burn that inverter ready motor up due to a phenomena called voltage overshoot between the drive and the motor. Okay. So distance is a big factor in that voltage overshoot. There are filters I can use if I have to have that motor longer than 35 feet away from the drive that will mitigate that voltage overshoot problem. This one instead of a harmonic filter is called a slew rate filter. <coughs> and it essentially addresses what the drive manufacturers call voltage overshoot. So what happens is because of the repetitive pulses, the way this drive is functioning and uh, reducing the frequency and the voltage in your typical VVF VF drive, the longer you have that distance of that conductor cable, those pulses in combination with that impedance start to grow the voltage the farther that distance becomes. In a 480 volt drive on a 480 volt motor, in some downhole submersible oil pumps where the pump's down at the bottom, submersible, the drive's up here, 700 feet, 1,000 feet, we're measuring 1,200 volts at the motor terminal due to this phenomenon. What type of insulation rating did that 480 motor have on it? 600 volt rated. What did the cable have on it? 600 volt rated. I've seen 1,400 volts at the bottom of a downhole submersible with the VFD on the surface. So now, what happens to that insulation fairly quickly? It degrades and gets pinholes in it, things like that. Motor and the cable. So the slew rate filter, by putting that in there, prevents that from happening. Or, I could go to the other now, inverter duty motor. 
So now the inverter duty motor is meant to combat both the heating and this voltage overshoot. So it's specifically built to take on either one of these problems. It has H insulation class with special inverter spike resistant insulation. That's a fancy way of saying it's got 1600 volt insulation on the motor windings to withstand those repetitive spikes we get from that long distance between the drive and the motor. So now it also usually has no limits on distance because we've used that 1600 volt insulation and it generally doesn't require the filters like a regular motor, motor would because now we've built that into the motor when we bought it although it's a more expensive motor. Many of these motors will also have non-metallic bearings some type of ceramic bearing because now the harmonics from the motor drive from the VFD going to the motor won't make those bearings vibrate at the right resonant frequency if they're ceramic because they've essentially designed those to have a really really high resonant frequency that drives don't produce and I don't lose bearings in that situation I can't tell you the number of air conditioning retrofit, blower fan retrofits. I've seen people put VFDs in existing buildings to control the airspeed coming out of the vents. 18 months later, the bearings in those motors are shot because of the harmonics coming off the VFD, causing bearing vibration and resonance. 